Welcome everyone to episode four of the Property Investing Podcast brought to you by Real Estate Investor. I'm Dennis Wong and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about holiday homes as an investment strategy and also provide you with an important update on the government's proposed changes to reduce depreciation deductions for property investors as there has been some clarity since the last update in episode two of our podcast. Now, as per the end of our last episode, I did mention we were going to be joined by a special guest to talk about subdivisions, but unfortunately, Justin Hams has fallen ill. So we'll invite him back to talk to us in one of our future episodes. But until then, let's get straight into this episode. For those investors looking at holiday homes as a strategy, in this part of the podcast, I'm going to talk to you about what's involved, the pros and cons, and provide you with some tips and ideas to think about. So what is a holiday home strategy? Well, this is when you rent out your investment property to holiday makers as a holiday let, and it can be in the form of a house, apartment, or even townhouse. They're generally located in locations close to holiday destinations, such as the beach or ocean, uh, up in the mountains or rainforest, and close by to local attractions. Now, there are plenty of ways to advertise and opportunity to build a business in its own right. And it's extremely important that you need to make it stand out, especially now where there are so many websites such as Stays and Airbnb, where anyone can make their property or a portion of their property available to let. Now, your holiday home should be within two hours of a local CBD. Generally, that's the magic number for performance as it caters to those spontaneous people who want to get out of town for the weekend. So how does it work? Well, here are a couple of things I think you need to consider. You're going to need to furnish the house and make sure you've got supplies that um, an ordinary house would would generally have. So think of appliances, small and large, uh, everything from toasters, the microwave, fridge, washing machine and dryer. Then you've also got items such as cutlery, plates, beds, the couches, outdoor furniture and a TV. Now you may provide a linen service as well as other perks such as Wi-Fi, pay TV, Uh, streaming services such as Netflix or Stan, uh, a barbecue, uh, or even a a playground set. Now, tenants will generally book for short stay periods with peaks achieved around the holiday periods like Christmas, uh, New Year, Easter, and the school holidays. So you might want to consider enforcing terms for these periods where they need to stay a minimum number of nights. And you'll also have to consider how to maintain the property in terms of cleaning and gardening, you know, to keep the property holiday ready and immaculate for every booking. Now, what about the pros and cons? Well, the pros of having a holiday home as an investment include the opportunity to make a business out of your asset. Uh, You can earn higher yields versus traditional renting. Uh, There is better depreciation due to the additional furnishings. You can also get access to yourself in most circumstances. Now, personally, I'd avoid staying at my own holiday home uh, during the peak times because you can earn more revenue then. I generally would rather go during the off-peak season. Um, And it's also a great way to purchase a family, uh, future family holiday home. Uh, And the property could be a retirement plan. So for example, you know, buying a place in Byron Bay, you know, with the plans of eventually retiring there. So what about the cons? Well, it does involve a lot of management. It's gonna cost you money and or time. Things may get broken and you'll need to replace items and there could be noise complaints as well. Uh, Your tenants are there for a good time all of the time. And depending on the demographic you're planning to target, this will either increase or decrease the amount of management that's gonna be required. Now, the property will usually be far from where you live, so it's gonna be harder to manage and check. Uh, There is more stuff to manage. You know, think of gleaning, gardening, furniture, bonds, you know, key handover. Uh, check-in, check-out process, you know, you got to think about how you're going to manage this. Uh, And if you get it wrong and no one wants to visit, it can be negative in value and in cash flow and then be even more difficult to sell if you want to offload it. Now, there are some key points in identifying the best location for the highest returns. So as I mentioned already, you know, try and stay within two kilometers uh, of the city uh, or two hours of the uh, the CBD, sorry. Uh, Target areas, Uh, with all year round attractions and activities, uh, target areas where people are likely to want to stay there for up to a week at a time in peak or, you know, just over the weekend in off peak times. Uh, You know, make sure the location has at least a pub or a cafe, uh, a bakery and a community playground at a minimum. 
uh, and get as close to local attractions and a main street as possible, you know, for both tenancy and security reasons. Now, here are the, some of the main expenses uh, that you need to be aware of for holiday lets. So there's things like electricity, maybe gas, you've got water expenses, gardening, cleaning, uh, management and payment processing, furniture replacement, obviously with more people coming in uh, over short periods of time, you know, wear and tear is going to um, definitely be an issue you need to be aware of. Linen in some cases, uh, gas bottles uh, or firewood and other consumables such as tea bags, uh, instant coffee, laundry detergent, uh, and make sure that you do seek professional advice for insurance, tax, and also legal items. You know, you need the right insurance and need to make sure it covers holiday lets. You know, your standard landlord insurance just, just won't cut it. Uh, make sure you get legal advice as well when you're doing up the terms and conditions of stay and ensure that your tenants are always provided a copy. Now, once the property is set up, you know, make sure you engage in a quantity surveyor such as our partner, Washington Brown, to prepare a depreciation schedule for you. You know, this can return big dollars when it comes to tax time, given the amount of items that you're providing. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of what you can claim under the plan and equipment. Now, here are my top nine tips for the best results when it comes to uh, holiday homes as an investment strategy. You know, number one, keep the audience as broad as possible. Appeal to the biggest pool of people. Number two, research your competition. You know, go online to stays, Airbnb, you know, maybe even Google the words accommodation in your target area and see what comes up. You know, there could be um, uh, people out there with their own websites set up for uh, their own exclusive locations. Um, and, you know, they could be other holiday homes that um, are available for rent privately. So, you know, just jump online and Google it. Number three, aim for good investment growth and high yield returns. Uh, four, provide things like internet uh, and pay TV. Uh, five, easy access to uh, locations like lakes or beaches where... Uh, people can go to go for a swim. Uh, number six, you know, make it a, a home away from home. Uh, seven, think about who your target tenants are going to be and aim to meet their needs. So, uh, you know, think toys, playgrounds, board games, computer game consoles for, you know, families with, with young kids. Number eight, make sure you stay on top of the numbers. You know, treat it like a business. And finally, the number nine tip, you know, update and upgrade it as, as, as you can just to make sure that you can stay competitive. So if you keep these tips in mind and you can get it right from the beginning, holiday home revenues will grow stronger over time. You know, if you can provide a holiday home that's gonna be memorable, relaxing and comfortable, you'll start to get repeat visitors, word of mouth spreads, and you'll even have existing people who live nearby recommend their family or friends to stay there when they come and visit. Next in this podcast, I'd like to give you an update following on from episode two of our podcast where I spoke about the federal budget changes and how it would reduce the depreciation property investors can claim on residential properties. Now, at the time, there was still some uncertainty due to the language used in the budget. Now, Tyron Hyde, the director of Washington Brown, our quantity surveyor partner, said the proposed changes weren't 100% clear during a webinar I hosted with him in June. Now, on Friday, the 14th of July, the Treasury Office released a draft bill regarding how depreciation deductions on secondhand property can be claimed. Now, Tyron has tried to simplify the bill and has summarized it into eight key points. Point one, if you acquire a secondhand residential investment property after the 10th of May, 2017, which contains previously used depreciating assets, you'll no longer be able to claim depreciation on those assets. So essentially, if I purchase the house today, I'm not going to be able to claim depreciation on items such as the oven, carpets, light fixtures, or dishwasher. Point two, if you purchase a brand new property, you'll be able to carry on claiming depreciation exactly the way it has been done so to date. Number three, proposed changes only relate to residential property. So commercial, industrial, retail, and other non-residential properties are not affected by these changes. Point four, the building allowance or claims on the structure of the building hasn't changed. So this component typically represents about 80 to 85% of the construction of the property. Point five, the proposed changes don't apply if you buy the property in a corporate tax entity super fund, but please note, self-managed super funds don't apply or a large unit trust. 
Point six, if you engage a builder to build a house and it stays as an investment property, you can still claim depreciation on both the structure and the plant and equipment items. Point seven, now if you renovate a property that's being used as an investment, you will be able to claim depreciation on it when you finish the renovations. But if you renovate a house whilst living in it and then sell it to an investor, the asset will be deemed to have been previously used and the new owner cannot claim depreciation. And number eight, finally, property investors will have the benefit of paying less capital gains tax when they decide to sell the property. So what an investor would have been able to claim in depreciation before the budget changes, that amount that gets taken off the sale price. So good example, you know, I buy a property today for $500,000 and included within the property is $25,000 worth of previously used depreciation, depreciating assets. So if I sell the property in five years time for $700,000, which includes $15,000 worth of those depreciation assets, I can now claim a capital loss of $10,000 for the portion that I haven't been able to claim in depreciation. So I hope that's given you more clarity, but if you like more information, please visit Washington Brown at washingtonbrown.com.au. Get in contact and one of the consultants will definitely be able to assist. Well, thank you so much for tuning in please feel free to visit our blog at blog.realestateinvestor.com.au to access lots more great content and resources that we have available. And if you need any assistance at all with your research, please don't hesitate to book in for a demo on our pro membership tools. I'll be happy to show you how that all works or book in for a free consultation if you'd like to talk to one of our senior property strategists to see if we can help you. So I look forward to our next podcast and hopefully Justin will be feeling much better then. So until then, happy investing and I'll catch you next time.